good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Grimsby Baptist Church on this 24th of September. Um, it's great that you're here this morning. It's great that the place is full. Uh, it's good to see you. I hope you've had tea and coffee already before the service started. And uh, we've got a few notices before I just read a passage of Scripture to focus us before we worship our great God together. Uh, there's an away day, which I told the 9.30 or 9.15 this morning was on the 14th of August. And thankfully... <laughs> Thankfully, they all shouted back, October! So I thought, that's good, because the message has gotten in. It's on the 14th of October. We've got an away day. If you want to sign up for that, Katrina's got a, a, a thing to sign up on at the back, or it's at the back. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the table at the back, so please do do that before you leave. Quite a few have signed up already, which is great, so it's going to be a great day, so please do join us. You don't want to miss out on that. We've got Nick coming, Nick Murray, who's going to be speaking to us, and there's an opportunity just to, to get to know each other and chill out over tea and coffee and, and eat together, so that'll be really a really good day. We've also got a church meeting on Wednesday at 7.30, so please do come along to that. We're thinking within that meeting, we've got different things happening, but one of the things we're thinking about is moving towards an eldership in the church, uh, elders and deacons. Colin's going to start a new series on that for us this morning, looking forward to that from Acts chapter 20, and then next week uh, we're, looking, we're looking today at the priorities of elders, next week the priorities of deacons from Acts 6, and then we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Timothy 3 uh, for the last two, and in the middle of all that, We've got a baptism service, so God willing, that'll be great, won't it? So three people being baptised on the 8th of October. So all that uh, is coming up, but we want to be thinking about some of those things on Thursday evening in the church meeting. Fun Family Friday on Friday, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I thought so, because it wasn't one this week. So Fun Family Friday and all the groups are back, cameo, uh, tots, different things. Uh, probably not life groups this week because of the church meeting, but some are still meeting, so you need to just find out if your particular group is meeting or not. And also, um, we're not having an offering anymore in the service because most people are sort of giving online and things, but still, some people are bringing cash and stuff. So rather than have an offering, we've got these boxes. There's one at the front and there's one at the back, so you can pop them in there uh, on the way out. Just That's the place to, to put your offering, so please uh, do that. Is there anything else I might have missed that I haven't put on the thing? Is, what is it? What is it? What is it? I want my dad. Is that what I've missed? Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. Great. In that case, let me read a few verses from Psalm 133, which lead us into our first song. Psalm 133. It says this. If I can find it. Let's turn the page. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head running down on the beard. Now, I'm sure that means something different in a different culture because that doesn't sound like much of a blessing to us, does it? But I think in these hot places, when the oil is poured over the head, it's refreshing. It's like that oil running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe, as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there, there, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So let's stand together and sing our first song. Oh, how good it is.
that we can come before you in unity and love. We ask for your guidance as we move forward together as a church, knowing that you are the head, the cornerstone of everything we do. Thank you that you would call us your children and you would lead us as a loving father, always and forever. Amen. shines in all that you have made. 
Oh. Oh. Goodness me. Oh. oh. This ain't the toxic waste dump, is it? Oh, I don't know. Some parts look a bit toxic waste. Oh, goodness. <coughs> Let me put this down a second. Hang on. Oh. Oh. Go. I tell you, this, 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 this toxic waste, it, it, is, it is dangerous stuff, I tell you. I, I, oh, been carrying it for miles. Heavy, heavy stuff. Oh, what have we got in here then? Oh, oh no, I need some gloves. You don't mind, do you, if I get a bit of toxic waste out here, do you? No health and safety in this church then, eh? No? No? All right, let's see what we can do. I need my glove. Let me stick my glove on. Oh. Oh, it's a tough old day today, I tell you. Don't get paid in this job, you know. We're on strike on Wednesday, along with the rest of the country. Here we go. Oh. Oh, here we go. Oh, it's nasty stuff, but it's got full of weight in it. It's really heavy. You see that? What's this? Oh, wise words. Yeah, wise words. That's what we say down in the Hampshire like that. Wise words. <laughs> Jealousy. Jealousy, who, who, who knows the word jealousy? Yeah, has anybody been jealous in their lives? Anybody? Oh, not as many as I thought. You know, <laughs> jealousy's toxic, it really is. It's not good stuff. It even says so in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs that these wise words have been based on. It says this, it says, anger is cruel and wrath is like a flood, but jealousy is even more dangerous. It's dangerous. Who gets jealous? Kids, come forward so I can see you. Come up here, because I can't even see where you all are. Come to the front. Anyone who dares. I'm not going to put any of the toxic waste on you, I promise. <laughs> come forward so I can see you. Anybody who dares, just to this bit here. No one dares. I don't blame you. Okay, stay where you are then. Yeah. No one's coming. That's all right. That's okay. Wow, you're usually more brave than this. Ah, oh, Stella and Zoe are coming. Good, 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 good. Ah, oh, come on. Anybody want to join them? Hello. Well, there we are. A bit of encouragement from the S. I, I, I'll move it slightly back just in case, because that that's some pretty toxic stuff. Yeah, so jealousy. Now, can anybody think of the things that you might be jealous of? And then I will tell you a couple of things. Anybody th can think of anything? Well, let me start you off. Like this week, even this week, I've been jealous. I was on an aeroplane coming back from a country called Romania. And I walked onto the aeroplane, and there were these people with lots of leg room, their legs up, and, and just been able to stretch out. It's, it's a, a, an area called first class. And then there's business class. And then there's cattle class, which is back here, is where I end up being. So I had my knees up behind my head, squished in in the middle seat, and I was jealous of all these people that were sat in these wonderful seats. But it's not just me who was jealous this week. Do you know who else was jealous this week? Who? My wife, her name's Yolanda. She was jealous. Yesterday, we were taking our son to get, take him to university for the first day. And guess what? We went to visit some friends in, in Liverpool, and we went into this wonderful kitchen. Now, our kitchen's about this. You could maybe just do this in our kitchen. This kitchen was the size of not quite the, as big as this church, but it was big. And so my wife looked to that kitchen and thought, oh, I would love a kitchen like that. Oh, yeah, a kitchen with an island in the middle and all these things. So... You know, I don't think she was feeling really jealous, but she would like that. But we can feel jealous about all kinds of things, can't we? Sometimes we can be jealous of our friends, can't we? We can be jealous of our friends because perhaps we think they're so cool. They got the best trainees, the train trainees, trainers. They got the best clothes. They've got Nike and Adidas and all of this stuff, and they look so cool. And we just maybe don't have the same things that they have. When I was a little boy, I used to be jealous of my friends' parents' cars. They would drive up to school in a Capri or a Cortina. Shows how old I am. OK, you would never have heard of those cars. But, you know, just think of your parents coming up in a Mercedes or, or, a, or a really nice BMW or something. And you think they come up to school, they drive to school in that car, 
And my parents went to school in a larder, yes. <laughs> a Russian-made, beat-up old car, and I tell them to park around the corner. And I was jealous of my friends who had parents who could afford to have this wonderful car. So that's another thing we could be jealous about, cars. Sometimes it's about uh, people's popularity. Oh, everybody likes him, or everybody likes her in school, but nobody really likes me, and we can start getting angry we can start feeling really rotten inside, and we get jealous of that other kid at school who's so popular. I want to be like that. I really want to be like that person. Sometimes it might be holidays that they go on. They go, they go on holiday to, to the, the, the wonderful islands in the, in the uh, Caribbean. But I'm just can't even, can't, we don't even get to go on holiday. And we can feel jealous and angry about those things. And in these days, with, 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 uh, or with Facebook and things, we can be jealous of how many friends people have on Facebook or, or WhatsApp and likes and all of these things. All of those things can make us jealous. You know, sometimes also we can be jealous of how clever somebody can be. You know, I, I don't know, if, I hope any, have, have any of you seen the movie Barbie? It's really popular at the moment. Yeah. Well, there's a song in that, 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 that movie, and it's called this, I'm Just Ken. And he's really jealous of Barbie, because she's like the popular one, isn't she? I'm just Ken. I'm just dumb. There's nothing about me. Jealousy. It's all jealousy. You know, the Bible t- tells us of a story of, uh, of jealousy, and it's a story of Joseph. Who knows that story? Do you know that story, the story of Jesus? One of my favorite stories in the Bible, but it begins with a lot of jealousy. They were jealous of Joseph. Why? Why were they jealous of Joseph? The, his brothers, 10 brothers, and they were all jealous of Joseph. Why? Anybody know? You're all so quiet today, but you're all looking so intently. Well, they were jealous because really daddy seemed to like him more than the other brothers. They gave him a what? What did they give him to wear? Everybody knows that. A beautiful coat, didn't they? A coat of many colours as we hear. A wonderful coat made him look really, really nice and set him apart from the others. He was kind of daddy's favourite. He even, they even talked to them, like, uh, to, to his brothers and told them that they would even bow down to him. And they got more and more jealous. And that jealousy got worse and harder and terrible inside, so they thought of some real nasty plans to get rid of Joseph. They were going to kill him. But in the end, they decided to sell him and as a slave, and he was taken down to the country of Egypt. What a horrible thing to do. But the root of all of that was jealousy. Jealousy is toxic. It's truly toxic. But it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? that we can have forgiveness. We need to stay away from jealousy, but Christ tells us that we can have forgiveness. When, when we read in the Bible, uh, John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, and that's you, me, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that gives us the opportunity to have all of our sins forgiven, doesn't it? Because Jesus gave his life for us. So sins like jealousy can be forgiven. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's wonderful, isn't it? And we can ask the Lord Jesus then to help us to not be jealous anymore. Because jealous makes us angry and bitter and makes us really, uh, brings out nasty feelings within us. It's wonderful. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Saved from your sins, just like, his je- just like jealousy. So that's what jealousy is all about. That's the wise word for the day. Thank you for coming out. And uh, I'm just going to pray for you guys. Father, we do thank you uh, for your goodness to us. We thank you that we can come to you. And we know that our sins, the bad things that we do, uh, can be forgiven. Help us, though, Lord, not to be jealous but to serve you in all that we do. We pray for these young ones as they grow. We just pray, Lord, that they will learn to love and follow after you in all that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I think all the kids are going to be going out in this song.
we're going to stand together and confess and say what we believe in. We believe in God our Father. We believe in Christ the Son. Let's stand together and remind ourselves of our beliefs. Please stand.
we have an opportunity to pray together. I'm going to use Paul's prayer for the Colossians in the beginning of Colossians chapter 1 to help us as we uh, pray together. So let's come before our great God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so involved in our lives, that you touch us deeply, that by your spirit you give understanding and wisdom that lead to lives lived that are worthy of you, that bear fruit for you in this world in which we live. We ask that you will continually fill us with the knowledge of your will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives, so that we may live a worthy life, Worthy of you, Lord, and please you in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in our knowledge of you. We also ask, loving Father, that we would be strengthened with all the power according to your glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience. These are things that we would naturally struggle with. Lord, we recognize our need of you. We need endurance, we need patience, and as we've just been hearing, so often we can have jealousy. Lord, we pray as we struggle against the things that we shouldn't have, you would give us the things we need. Give us joyful hearts, Father, we ask, as those who have qualified to share in the inheritance of your holy people in the kingdom of light. Why? Because you have rescued all those who truly trust in Jesus from the dominion of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom of the son you love. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. Father we pray that these great truths would drive us this week. As we seek to live for your glory. We do remember those who are in need of prayers at this time. Those who struggle with the effects of this sinful world. Which is all of us. Especially when we've just heard a talk like that. Those facing challenges too big for them alone. Strengthen them, Lord, with all power, we ask, according to your glorious might. Steve's asked for prayer this morning for his mum, Margaret, who's on her way over next week and flying uh, next Monday. We pray that you'd be with her and help her. We pray for those who would love to be here this morning but can't. We think of Colin in Cambridge Park. We think of Eric Carter having another operation tomorrow. We pray that you'd bless them. And help them. Think of Nigel and Jane with family. Oh Lord, we pray that not just those, but that others are too. Too many to name in some ways. They'd love to be here. Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom and, and meet with them in a particularly special way this morning. Father, we pray for those in different parts of the world, persecuted because they share the same hope as us. Oh Lord, help them to know that that hope is eternal. Strengthen them, we pray that that same hope that gives them hope for the future will give them hope for today. We pray for those drifting away from you through inattention to you. Oh Lord, we pray that you'd wake them up. We pray that you would speak to them and they would be responsive to your voice. And as we seek to take this amazing news of forgiveness that Paul prays about to these Colossians that Steve's been telling us about, to a dying world, Lord, we ask that you would go before us. We ask that you would be opening hearts and minds. We ask that you would be drawing people to yourself. As we've started Christianity Explored, and as we've got the groups back up and running, things like Fun Family Friday, Cameo, Tots, these opportunities that we have to reach out, Lord, we ask that you would use our endeavours for the glory of your name and for the extension of your kingdom. All-powerful, loving, faithful God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to continue in prayer, really, as we sing our next song. It's this song, Take Time to Be Holy. We'll stand together and sing it. Thank you.
Good morning. Okay. Right, the read today is taken from Acts 20, uh, verses 17 to 39. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement 
that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Well, good morning. Uh, It's nice to see you all. It's nice to be um, in the fellowship being together and looking at God's Word. As Jason said, we're beginning a new series on on elders as we look as a fellowship uh, to see where the Lord's going to lead us in actually appointing uh, elders to be uh, shepherds over the flock, elders and deacons. So where do we go from here? What do we begin to look at as we say, Lord, how are you going to lead us in establishing an eldership? And so Acts chapter 20 gives us a a tremendous foundation. But before we go to Acts 20, I just thought I'd begin by just sharing three things which really stand out regarding elders. Elders are people who care for the body of Christ. So as we're praying as a church, we need to be looking for men who care. Men who care for the fellowship. Men who care for the body. Then elders are those who teach the word. We need to be looking for men who can open up the word of God and teach it and make it relevant in our daily lives to each of our daily situation. Caring. Teaching. And then we need elders who can model the character of Christ as we begin to look for men who will be elders among us. Can we see men and say, yes, this man is a model of the character of Christ in his daily life? So let's pray together as we begin. Father, we thank you for the privilege of looking at elders And what the principle is here, we thank you already for what we've just looked at. We pray, Father, that you'll lead us to men who can be elders who care for the body. Men who are able to teach the word and make it relevant in today's world and into our own lives. We pray for men who can model the character of Christ in their lives, their families, and in our fellowship. Lord, as we look now to Acts chapter 20 and look at some of these principles here, open our hearts, Lord, open our minds to see wonderful truths here that we can apply in our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you open your Bibles, please, again to Acts 20, page 1117 in the church Bibles, I'd like to suggest we can look at two things from this chapter. The first thing is Paul is talking about five principles of shepherding. What does it mean to shepherd God's flock? Look at five principles here. And then we'll look at five priorities for elders. What are these priorities that we should be looking for? So beginning first of all with the five principles of shepherding, the first one is here in verse 17 of Acts 20. The Apostle Paul had um, celebrated the Passover in Philippi. And he was looking forward to going to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So he was traveling. And in verse 17 it says he came to this place called Miletus. And while he was there he sent for the elders of the church. And I'd like to suggest he started to share with them these five principles. So what does it mean to be a shepherd? What can we as a church be looking for? Well, first of all, the first principle of being a shepherd is he has a right perspective towards ministry. And if you look at uh, verse 17, from Miletus, Paul sent for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day from the province of Asia. He says in verse 18, you know how I lived. He mentions it again in verse 20, you know how I lived. You know my life. 
Paul's life was an open book. It was authentic. He was transparent. He was real. You know me. You've seen me. You are aware of my life and my character. Many years ago, I, I, I remember watching a, a television program. I don't remember what it was, but it was four men or five people on a panel. For example, they all pretended to be Colin Lamb. So somebody had to stand up and say, I am Colin Lamb, I am this, I'm this, I'm this. And each person tried to say who Colin Lamb was. And at the end of that, all of these four or five people said who they were, and then the person that was leading it said, OK, will the real Colin Lamb please stand up? And of course, up stands the, the real person. What Paul is saying here, you've seen me. You've seen my life. You've seen my character. He was an open book. And I think the key word that comes in here is integrity. Have you heard that word before? You know, the importance of integrity. We need to look for godly men who have a right perspective towards ministry, but have a life of integrity. What you see is real. There's no pretense about them. Authentic, transparent, real. The second one comes in verse 19. Uh, a right perspective towards God. And this has to do with serving. He's a man who serves. Paul says, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. I serve the Lord. That word serving it has the idea of doulos. It's the servant. It's a, a willing bond slave. When I think of that, it often reminds me of in Exodus, there was this man who was a, a slave and he was a slave for his master for seven years. And at the end of that seven year period, his master had to let him go. But if that servant would come to the master after seven years, he could say to his master, I love my master. I don't want to go free. I want to serve my master forever. The master would take his by the ear, take him to the doorpost, and put a hole in his ear. So wherever that man went, you could see a hole in his ear. And when you saw that man, you'd say, there's a man who loved his master and didn't want to go free. Let's look for men who love the master, who want to serve him, give their lives to him, and to serve the flock. I love my master. I don't want to go free. Paul says, with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing. I don't know, have you ever cried? Uh, I'm afraid that I think my eyes are too close to the tap. I can, I can cry very, very easily. Uh, and um, sometimes I cry because of sometimes the things I do or I'm asked to do. I don't think I've ever cried on a Sunday morning before I stood up, but nearly, Lord, I can't do this. I need you. But Paul, in his ministry, he was crying sometimes with tears for the fellowship. He loved the flock. And sometimes, because of his love, he was in tears and severe testing. So basically, he's a man who's a servant. Let's look for a man to be an elder who's servant-hearted. And then in verse 20, a right perspective towards the church. The man who's going to be an elder is going to be a teacher. Look at this in verse 20. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've been involved in sharing with you, teaching you, whatever is valuable, whatever is needful for you, I've done it publicly, and I've come with you, and I've been with you house to house. He's a man who can teach. He's a man who can get alongside you. He's a man who can help, a man who can shepherd. 
I've never hesitated to do that. Let's say, Lord, please lead us to a man like that. Look at verse 21. The fourth, f- fourth one here. A right perspective towards the lost. He said, I've declared both to the Jews and to the Greeks they must turn to God in repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus. There was this declaring and this clarifying. He's talking about repentance here. That people need to come to realize that they are sinners. Hopelessly lost. Nothing that they can do to become right with God. But Christ died for them. And they can say, thank you, Lord, for dying for me. For dying in my place. Turning around, repentance, changing, moving towards God and beginning to serve him. A man who understands clearly, I think, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says in Ephesians at the beginning that we are all doomed Drifting, dead in our trespasses and sins. Paul was teaching this faithfully. But then he carries on and says, we've been raised, we've been quickened, we've been made to sit with God in heavenly places. He's got this joy of being able to declare the wonder of the gospel of repentance and faith and being captivated by the greatness and the grace of God. Lord, lead us to men who can share the gospel But lead us to men who are captivated by grace. Are you captivated by grace this morning? Be thrilled and captivated by the wonder and the grace of God. Then fifthly here, uh, in verse 22, Paul has a right perspective towards himself. He said, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen there. He felt it was right for him to go to Jerusalem. He was being led by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, he says to the believers, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, what he's saying there when he's saying be filled with the Spirit, he's saying allow the Spirit of God in your life to lead you and guide you. As the Spirit of God takes his word, makes it real in your life. He prompts you and leads you and guides you. Allow yourself to be led by the Spirit of God in your daily life. Walking with him on a day-to-day basis. And Paul was compelled by the Spirit to go. And look what it says here. I know that when I go, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships face me. And as we finish this particular fifth thought, let me mention five things about Paul. He says here, I am convinced that this is what the Lord wants me to do. I'm being led by the Spirit. And he says, there are a number of things that as I go, this is true of me. First of all, he says, I'm an accountant. He said, I consider my life worth nothing. When I was a missionary overseas, um, I had to um, do my accounting every month. And at the end of the year, I had to send it to an accountant. And he had to put it all... I, I really didn't enjoy that at the end of every month, sitting down and putting all of these figures together. But he, I, you have to count it all together. At the end of it, you submit it to the tax man. But Paul is accounting. He said, I've added up everything in my life. And he said, I want to let you know this. I consider my wife life worth nothing. For me, my life is worth nothing, but my aim is to finish the race. See, he was an accountant. He evaluated what his life was like, but then he says, I'm an athlete. I want to finish the race, to finish what God has got for me. An accountant, an athlete. Then he says, I'm a witness. Wherever I go, I want to testify to the good news of the grace of God. God's made himself too real to me. I count myself nothing. I want to witness. But I just know the wonder of the grace of God in my life. And I want to pass that on to other people. An accountant, an athlete, a witness. And then in verse 25, he's a herald. Now I know that none of you, 
whom I have gone about preaching will ever see me again. I've been preaching. I've been teaching. I'm a herald. Wherever I go, I have to preach. I have to share. That's been my life. And then he says, I'm a watchman. I declare to you I am innocent of the blood of all of you. I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole council of God. He's a watchman. Let's be looking for a man who's an accountant. I want my life to be what God wants. Let's be an athlete willing to run the race. Be a witness. Use the opportunities to share with each other out of church and in church. Be a herald. Being willing to share what God's made real to you and watch. He needs to watch and be aware of all that's going on. So five principles of shepherding. Let's look at the next section where Paul begins to talk about, okay, now let's move one step forward. Let's look at five principles for eldership. So here we go here. What kind of person, as we think and pray, what kind of person do we look for in being an elder? First of all, we need to look for someone who keeps right with God. What he says here in verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Keep watch over yourselves. If you think about 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and what you believe closely. We need to see men who can keep right with God, that have a day-by-day walk with God, that are watching their lives, and are, are walking with the Lord, and are keeping right with the Lord. Watch your life closely. There's another amazing verse in Proverbs 27 that says this, Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Pay careful attention to your herds. We need to have elders who pay careful attention to the flock and know the flock. Um, I do have a bit of a problem. And I don't know all of you. And... uh, I do have another problem, is that if I did get to know you, I forget your name. So please don't come up and say, do you remember what my name is? Maybe you could say, my name is. When my wife and I were in training in Australia, during the training we were there for a few years, um, I used to say to my wife, uh, Brenda, I'd say when we're going out with other people, I'd say, hey, wife, let's go home. And someone would say to one of the lecturers one day, hey, why does Colin keep saying wife? And the teacher said, I don't know. I think it's because he's forgotten her name. (laughs) You see, be sure you know the conditions of your flock. I'd like to get you to know you better. I'd like you to get to know us better. Maybe you don't want to. But, but, you know, we need to get to know each other. And... uh, An elder gets to know the flock. We need to choose men who want to get to know the flock. So keep watch over your flock. Watch over yourselves. Because it says here, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Isn't that amazing? You see, you're the overseer if you're an elder. But it's the Holy Spirit that's made you an overseer. It's God's work. It's the Spirit of God that's leading you and guiding you. So first of all, the elder needs to keep right with God. Secondly, the elder is to feed and to guard. Verse, it says, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Peter says, we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. You see, be shepherds of God's flock, which he's bought with his blood. Let me read this once more. Look at this here. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his blood. In other words, what Paul is saying is, when you become a shepherd, you need to feed the church of God, which 
He, the Lord Jesus, has bought with his blood. And by the way, elder, the flock's not yours, it's mine. When we do appoint elders, the flock is not the elders, the flock is the Lord's. We are the Lord's. And so the Lord is saying, when you appoint elders, you need to appoint men who can be aware and look after the flock that God has given to them. It's powerful, isn't it? The right perspective towards the flock, feed the flock. And thirdly, it says here, to watch and warn. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock, even from your own number. Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples away. See, we need to watch and warn because savage wolves will come in and destroy the flock from outside. I've been aware in the past of people who have come into a church, made friends with the church, got to know everybody, and then after a while they start teaching false teaching from within. People come in from without. It's interesting, this morning Stephen said to me, I'm doing this um, children's talk on um, being toxic and dangerous. I don't think it fits into your message. I think it could fit in here, doesn't it? Because jealousy is toxic. False teaching is toxic. It can destroy the flock. And so thirdly, Paul says here, watch and warn, because people will come in from outside, even from among us within. We need to be careful and watch and be on our guard. Fourthly, in, in verse 32... Paul says, keeping God's grace. He says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I mentioned this earlier on, but you know, he says, I'm committing you to the word of God and to the word of his grace. We need to have men who are captivated by grace. I remember when I was 16, Christmas, first Monday, 1962, in Bedford, 9.15 in the evening, I was in a social evening, and for the very first time I heard that Christ loved me, he died for me, I was a sinner, there was nothing I could do, but Christ died for me, and I sat there and I thought, thank you Lord, 9.15, Monday evening, 1962, before Christmas, I thought, thank you Lord, and I began to understand for the first time the wonder of God's grace. We need to stay captivated by God's grace. And we need to find elders who are captivated and live by God's grace. It's wonderful to be able to be captivated by that. And then in verse 33, Paul says he's free from self-interest. Notice in verse 33, he says, I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold. He wasn't after anything else. He was just involved in the ministry. He wasn't lazy. You yourselves know these hands of mine have supplied my own needs. He was busy working in the ministry. And in everything I did, I showed you that by the kind of hard work we must help the weak. He was a hard worker. Never apologized for hard work. Be willing to do that. I remember when I became a Christian, I was in our youth group, being on the open air meeting on the Saturday. And we went to the um, next week, and I said to the guy that led me to the Lord, you know we had an open air meeting last week? He said, yes. Uh, I said, can I speak on the open air? He said, yeah. He said, we've just had our evening meeting. And he said... Uh, um, we've had food. He said, uh, would you mind going into the kitchen and doing the dishes? I said, excuse me, Lance, but did you just hear me ask if I could be a speaker at the open air? He said, yeah, go and do the dishes, please. I said, what's that got to do with being on the open air? He said, well, start there. So I started putting the dishes away. Um, the following week, I said, hey, Lance, could I speak on the open air? 
He said, yeah, we've just finished the meeting. Would you put the chairs away, please? I didn't ask that same question again. But the thing is, you know, being a hard worker, willingly fitting in and serve. We want to look for deacons who are servants, who are being willing to serve. Keeping right with God, let's look for men who have a walk with God. Feed, lead and guard. Let's be looking for men who are feeding, leading, guarding. Let's look for men who are captivated by God's grace. And let's look for men who are free from self-interest. But in all of this, how does Paul finish? Look with me at verse 36. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with, knelt down with all of them and prayed. All of the elders together, as a group, as a team, knelt down and prayed. One of the things that really struck me about elders was they met together for worship, breaking of bread and prayer. Let's be looking for men who, are, men who want to pray, men who pray. Paul knelt down and prayed with them. But you know, as he prayed, they all wept together. They were a team, working together whole. Heartedly. What a wonderful privilege that is. Let's pray that the Lord will give us men who are right with God, can feed, lead, guard, watch and warn, captivated by God's grace, totally free from self-interest, men who are willing to lead and guide and serve. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you for the wonder of your word. And we thank you for Paul and his integrity, his willingness to serve, his ability to teach, to declare God's word and to live a life of self-sacrifice. Lord, lead us and guide us to men like that. Men who are walking with you, able to feed the flock, to watch and to warn us, captivated by God's grace, and are free to live and to serve. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, to enable us to um, try and fulfill some of those things, we can't do it on our own, can, I? can we? We have to fix our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. So let's stand together. <coughs> Thank you.
May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.